Good morning. Good morning. I think I got the... Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Good, 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 good. Um, you know what? I'm going to take my coat off because to be quite frank, it's warm in here. I am, I am burning up. And since we have so much scripture uh, to cover today, I think that uh, I need to get prepared for it. It's good to see everybody here today. Glad to see your smiling faces. We got the number of folks uh, gone from us. Uh, Steve and Donna have had quite the trip. I've got to tell you, they're up north, and uh, after the vehicle breakdowns, um, uh, now they're, I, I, I think they're having to deal with a whole lot of snow. Uh, and uh, so, anyway, we'll, we'll pray that they remain safe. Um, we're going to continue our study of the Genesis letter, and as you can see, we're going to be talking about uh, Abraham uh, today. You know, since the fall of man in the garden... Uh, God's prophecy of redemption and Satan's first attempt to destroy the seed line of Christ by killing off Abel, uh, God has continually protected the salvation which many enjoy. Uh, amen. This is exactly what Paul referred to when he spoke to the Ephesians about the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. Now, in Genesis, though, uh, in Genesis 12, we find the wisdom of God begin to be revealed through his interaction with Abram when he promised two things, a land promise and a seed promise. And I have these texts up here. Uh, the first one, we're going, to be, we're going to be looking at both of these here in a little bit in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, actually, uh, both of them there, but anyway, and then, then we're going to skip over to Genesis chapter 22. But these are the passages. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And so uh, you shall be a blessing, Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. Then you skip down to verse 7. There's another description of that land slash nation promise when he says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So in response to that, uh, Abram builds an altar and worships God. Now the seed promise is also seen in chapter 12 in verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then in chapter 22, verse 18, he goes on to uh, talk about this uh, seed uh, promise in more specific terms. He says, in your seed, and if you remember from Galatians, it says seed, not seeds as of many. And, and the same idea is here. He says, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And so, however, when we talk, when we look at all of the all of the information thus far, the the land uh, nation promise and and the seed promise, there is no doubt that there is in Christianity a historical nature. There's an historical nature to the church which Christ died to create. I find it disconcerting when people ignore this fact, ignore the historical nature of Christ's New Testament church. Now, a, this is important to understanding its unique character among the many world religious uh, entities that, that mankind has created, uh, that mankind has authored, uh, and even amongst Christianity, there are many who would distort what Christ really wants the church to be, what Christ wants redemption uh, to be. Uh, I have told you about a fellow that I've been in contact with in, in Mali, and he is wanting to uh, become a missionary. And I, uh, I asked him my initial question, because 1 John 4, 1 says, to test the spirits to see whether they may be of God. So I asked him, how is a person redeemed from their sin? And the answer that he gave me was only in God. And, and for us to be able to help somebody in mission work, we cannot help somebody who is not first and foremost going to teach a proper redemptive plan. And so I, I quizzed him more on that, and I will have to let uh, I will let you know uh, that his responses were very positive. So uh, uh, keep this uh, man in prayer as. Uh, 
may we continue to interact with him. Anyway, here's the question. Where must a person be in order to gain eternal life? This is different from saying, what must a person do to gain eternal life? Because when a person accepts Christ, when a person is redeemed, when a person is saved, they are added to the body of Christ, which the Ephesian letter teaches is the church of Christ. So when I say, where must a person be in order to find eternal life or to be redeemed, it is the historical church which God foreordained, which God planned, which God predestined in order, uh, uh, in order for us to be a part of today. And, and the Ephesian letter in chapter 5 gives us, gives us a really good answer to this question when we begin in the latter part of verse uh, 23, I mean verse 25, where it says there, Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. And, and that is where we need to be. If a person wants to be redeemed from their sin, the location is the church which Christ died to create. That's what Ephesians says it's only the other. So we need to examine Abraham's story and in so doing find great reasons to bask in the glory of God as not just our Father but also our Redeemer. So we need to look at an historical overview. And I've got a kind of a graph up here. There's a lot of passages uh, that we need to kind of take a peek at and uh, they will provide us some information about this. Let me explain this just real quick, what we've got going on. For those watching on Facebook, I don't know if they're, if they're going to be able to see the uh, pointer on here, if I can find the right button. But anyway, we've got two sides of this. We've got the, the, the goalposts, uh, which sorry to say the Nebraska Huskers did not see enough of yesterday. Uh, but uh, hey, it's a, it's a tough group that they play. Anyway, we have the goal book. In the center of this is the cross. Now here, this is the creation line. Over here is the consummation line. Uh, that's another way of saying at the end of the ages, uh, the, the, the day of Christ's return. Okay, um, That's what that is there. Before all of this, we have the wisdom of God. At the end of all of this, the ultimate glory uh, for us. But prior to this, and after uh, each of this is eternity. From eternity to eternity. That's basically what, I'm, what this graph is called. It's the eternity graph. But anyhow, God's wisdom, uh, He planned something that was going to be revealed in Christ and in the church. And the ultimate purpose for this was also foreordained or predestined in His wisdom so that because of what's done in the Christ uh, uh, in Christ and with the church, we can experience that glory with God for all eternity. Here's, let me share with you a few passages. This is Ephesians chapter uh, 1, uh, verses 9 through 11. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. So when we read that passage, He's talking about things that have been predestined. He's talking about a revealed mystery. This mystery that was revealed remained a mystery in this period of history. That period of history is when all of this stuff is being played out. We're talking about uh, Genesis chapter 3 where, where God uh, uh, condemns the devil and pronounces a promise for mankind through Christ. It is this, uh, uh, in Abraham's life, it is beginning to be played out in a land, uh, a nation promise, 
and also in a seed promise. And everything that we see taking place in the Old Testament is nothing more than God protecting those promises that He originally gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Amen? Amen. That's what it is. So when Christ, when Christ comes to the cross, and if you missed our class this morning, we were in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 27, and of course it's a video uh, course, a video lesson, and so we we get to see actors portray that, and we saw, once again today, Christ being crucified uh, there, and, and he did that in order, in order to fulfill the wisdom of God, which this passage is talking about. Another one from Ephesians, this is chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Where it tells us there, <clears throat> in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. The mystery that is discussed right here, the promises that God gave to Abraham are revealed, are found in, are uh, are experienced, are taught through and in Christ's church. And if they're not done so, if those things are not taught here, then can we, can we correctly say that it is actually Christ's church? And the answer to that is absolutely no. Because if God's will and God's purpose is not revealed in the church, that is not the church Christ died to create. And again, we should say what? Amen. Amen. That's right. Another passage that we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 uh, through 10. It says here, Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages... Uh, uh, to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. Notice this. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which, hath, uh, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. And, and so, again, we have another passage written to another audience. The first ones we read were uh, to the brethren in Ephesus. This one to the brethren in Corinth. Both are for us and for everybody else who wants to answer the question, how do I find or where do I find eternal life? <clears throat> another passage. Let's look at this one. Romans chapter 8. I mentioned in class that we would be touching upon Romans. And here it is. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, that He might become, uh, that He might be the first more, uh, firstborn among many brethren. So, again, another passage talking about the, uh, uh, the predestined, the planning of God the purposes of God and those purposes being fulfilled in those who would follow Him. And then, of course, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says, uh, uh, Since the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself likewise also partook of the same, that He might render powerless Him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. That's the whole purpose what Christ did right there at the cross was to destroy death. This kind of information and how people need to respond to that information can only be found where? In Christ's church. And Christ's church has a historical background. Let's continue this uh, scheme of redemption. And, and all the passages that are up here, um, I, I, I want to spend a little more time on the 
uh, promises. So we're kind of, we're kind of going to rush through here, especially since what we're talking about here is a lot of review. Um, but anyway, there was a view of the seed promise from Adam to Christ. Remember Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, there, there is that curse that is pronounced upon. Uh, let me just go over there and read that. Remind us of what is mentioned there. If you, we are familiar with this. Adam and Eve, they fell prey to the temptation of eating that forbidden fruit. And uh, uh, this is what God says to the serpent. Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now, here's, here's the important part. This is verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, now he's saying between her seed, and now God gets specific about who that seed is when he says, He shall bruise you on the head, you shall bruise him on the heel. One is only a bump in the road, the other is a death blow. And again, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it tells us that Jesus rendered powerless him who had the power of death. And he did this when he was on the cross. He did this to Satan, according to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. And so when Jesus did that on the cross, guess what we see in there? Jesus, now, now Satan thinks that he has destroyed Christ. But when Christ rose from the grave three days later, that pipe dream of Satan just went right out the window. And in that act, in what Jesus did there, Satan's head was bruised. More than bruised, actually. But what did Satan do to Jesus? He was bruised on the heel. We might look at the cross and we think how horrible it was and everything that Jesus went through being hung up there. The suffering that he went through. But it was nothing compared to what Satan went through. And you know why? Because Jesus left behind an empty tomb. That's why he is uh, he is described in Genesis three verse fifteen as having his uh, just his heel bruised. This was the argument that Paul put toward the leaders in Acts chapters uh, I want to say twenty four twenty five uh, when uh, when he told uh, I can't remember if it was Felix or King Agrippa, but he but he said the phrase there is. Paul asserted this Jesus to be alive. That's what all of the disciples preach. A resurrected Savior. That's why we have Genesis 3.15 saying what it says there. So that's that view of the seed promise from Adam to Christ. We, this seed promise is traced from uh, uh, Seth to Noah. Because Genesis tells us that Eve uh, and Adam had another child. Uh, his name was Seth, and it was from Seth and his lineage all the way down to Noah that God protected the seed promise that he is giving to uh, Abram in Genesis chapter 12. The seed promise, the flood could not get rid of the seed promise. If Noah had not been found righteous, that would have ended history. But Noah was found to be righteous because he was found to be righteous. The lineage, the seed line promised in Genesis 3.15 continues on. The next the description we have is in Genesis chapters, uh, chapter 11 verses 10-26 through 26, where that seed line continues from Noah to Abram. And this is the passage that I want to read. So open your Bibles please to Genesis chapter 12. Because this is where our lesson is coming from uh, today. I'm going to read the first seven verses here. Now Noah, uh, now the Lord, sorry, now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. So God gives him this command. This is what I want you to do. This is what Abram, this is what you have to do, basically. He says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. 
and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was seventy-five uh, when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he, being Abram, built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So there is the text which, uh, which, which uh, tells us, uh, from which we see that uh, Abram, or that God is going to continue this seed line through Abram and his uh, kin, his descendants. The seed from Abram to Christ, Genesis 12, 3, 22, 18. I also want to take a peek at Galatians chapter 3. Because we need to read verses 8 and verse 16 from the Galatian letter. Because this seed line that we're talking about, uh, to which Abram was promised, is revealed to us in the New Testament. This is what we find here. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abram. What was the gospel that he preached? Because all I find is that God said to Abram, In you all the nations shall be blessed. And, and that is the gospel. Because it is his seed, speaking of Christ. Well, let's, let's read on here. All the nations shall be blessed. Skip down to verse uh, 16. Now the promises that we're talking about today were spoken to Abraham... And to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. All this becomes plain. These promises that were given to, uh, uh, to Abram uh, are made plain here when we read this from the Galatian letter. So, here's what I want us to uh, spend most of our time on. It's looking at that twofold promise to Abram. Uh, Abraham. And there is the, we have to see the fulfillment of the land nation promise. And there's some interesting things that unfold here. First of all, there's that promise that's given in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 7. The, in verse 1 of chapter 12 is that command. God says to Abram, get up and go. All right? Abraham does that. We see that from what? Verse, uh, uh, verse 5 and 6, I believe. But anyway, he, they, they go. And then um, this promise becomes a covenant in Genesis chapter 15. We're not going to read all of chapter 15, but what takes place here is, is uh, interesting. There is a, uh, there's promise given to God and, and uh, in, in, in this text, God says, I want you to take this animal and this animal and this animal and I want you to have them. Cut them in half. So God tells which animals to take. He tells what to do with each animal. And, and, and he divides them. And, and there is a technique in cooking called butterfly. Y'all know what that is? You take a cut of meat and, and you know, it might be this thick and you butterfly it. So you, you cut down this way and then you open, you, you basically open it up. That's almost like what he was to do here. However, he was to sever the halves. And so he takes the animal, he halves it, and he says, so there's this gap in between them. And when you read the story here, it seems like when they're laid out on the altar, there is this animal that's half. There is this animal that is half. There is this animal that is half. God has a fire that he creates and he goes down the middle of these and he goes in between them. 
And you can read, uh, this was a, this was something that was practiced. Uh, uh, Jeremiah tells us that, that they would have the animals and the people would go between them a, and a covenant would be formed. Look at verse 18 of Genesis chapter 15. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. And this is what he said. To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river of Euphrates. So now it's not just a promise which God has offered to Abraham, but it becomes a little bit more than that. He, uh, it becomes a covenant. There is a pact that has been formed between Abram and, uh, and God. The, the third thing that we need to know is that the covenant of is the covenant of circumcision as it pertained to the land, and this is seen in Genesis chapter 17. Uh, we know what the the rite of circumcision was a part of the uh, old covenant law, um, and and it's it's talked about throughout Scripture, even in the New Testament. You know, uh, we the the children. Uh, of God within the church are termed a circumcision. But anyway, in Genesis chapter uh, 17, the first four verses, or actually the first, uh, how many verses in the first 14 verses talk about this, but I want us to specifically look at verses 6 through 10. He says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you. And kings shall come forth from you. And I will establish... It. Now there is a promise. There is a covenant. Now here he says, I am going to establish this covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant uh, uh, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. And I will give to you, to your descendants after you, the land of your sojournings, all the land of your uh, of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. That's the correlation between this particular uh, uh, act of worship, uh, a, a sign of the covenant agreement between Abram's descendants and God. The <clears throat> promise is renewed to Isaac uh, in Genesis chapter 26. You know, because Abram wasn't going to live forever, uh, on earth, that is. He wasn't going to live forever. God gave the promise to Abram. And, and, and God makes this covenant. He establishes the covenant in Genesis chapter 17. And to prove to us, and even Abraham's family, what God does is to repeat this teaching. This seed promise is repeated to Isaac in Genesis chapter 26, the first four verses, and then also to Jacob in Genesis chapter 28 at the beginning of that text as well. Now, part of the seed promise, part of them becoming a great nation, also has to do with their, uh, uh, with their protection. Because what happened in, in Canaan land? History says there was a great famine. You know, and, and what happened? They all went down to Egypt. And the story goes through Joseph. You know, Joseph, uh, uh, one of the uh, 12 kids, the second to the youngest. Benjamin was the youngest. Then there was Joseph. And then, you know, the 10 older brothers. Anyway, they didn't like Joseph. Why? Because of the dreams he had, right? And so uh, his brothers come up with this plan. They throw him in the pit. Long story short, Joseph ends up in Egypt in control of all of the agricultural stuff in, in Egypt. And because of the wisdom that he displayed uh, before Pharaoh, 
he is basically managing all the crops. And so they bring them in, they got storehouses built and all that stuff. So God says to the Israelites to, you know, he says, I want you to go down to Egypt. So they go down to Egypt. How many years are they down? Uh, they're down there. 400 years, right? Uh, they're down, and they become a great nation. They, they, they come out of Egypt. And God said that when they came out of Egypt, they were going to come out with a lot of belongings. And, and before they left, uh, they, uh, uh, they requested of their neighbors, uh, we need this artifact, this artifact, this gold, this stuff, this, you know, all this stuff. And the Egyptians had no problem saying, here, get out of my land, you know, leave us. And so they all packed up, they went, Pharaoh regretted that, and what did he do? Sent his army, the Red Sea parts, and the uh, Israelites, they passed through on dry land, but the water closes over the Egyptians, um, protecting the seed line. Right? And so they go into uh, uh, Canaan land through Joshua's leadership. So, anyhow, <clears throat> we have that descent into Egypt. I want to read Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 26, verse 5. Uh, it says here, You shall answer and say, Behold, the Lord your God, my father, was a wandering Aramean. And he went down to Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. But there he became a great, mighty, and populous nation. Now, what one of the things that they did when they left, uh, when they left, of course, we have that Exodus uh, from Egypt, and it's uh, told to us in Exodus chapter six, uh, uh, basically the whole chapter there. Um, but when they left. They went to a place called Sinai. What happened at, at, at Sinai? Remember? They're below the mountain, and, and uh, Moses, he goes up the mountain. And how many days is he up there on the mount? Forty days and forty nights, right? And what's he doing up there? He is being given the law, the Ten Commandments, right? Of course, we know what the Israelites were doing at the foot of the mountain. You know, they were they were going off into idolatry again, and they had a tendency. Uh, that kind of has a tendency of of, of being drawn toward uh, bad stuff. You know, I was in the break room the other day, and one of my coworkers is a member of the body of Christ, and uh, a word came out of this person's mouth kind of surprised me. Um, I think it surprised her. Uh, you know, she made the statement. She says, I've been hanging around with uh, too many people that aren't, you know, in the church. And that's the point, folks. We're supposed to salt the earth, not the other way around. But if we're not, if we're not protecting who it is that we are in Christ, we have a tendency to be drawn toward idolatrous and sinful things. That's what that's what the Israelites were doing below the mountain. Anyway, I, I digress. There's there are three things for any nation to even be a nation. You know what those are? For any country on the face of this earth, for it to actually call itself a nation, it needs three things. It needs a land that they own. It needs a people to reside there. And it needs a law. Those three things are required for a nation to be a nation. What did God promise Abram? He promised him a land. A na there was a nation uh, that he would be a great nation. He had to have a land. God said, I'm going to give you Canaan. There had to be a people. Sent them down to Egypt, few in number. Uh, and they came out of Egypt, huge in number. So there's a people. They went to Sinai, and what did they get there? They got a law. Now they are a nation. God has fulfilled that promise. There is another promise that we need to examine. Um, we need to examine it quickly, don't we? Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we're familiar with that because this is the seed promise 
We know that the seed promise re was renewed to Isaac and to Jacob, and then it was given through uh, Judah in Genesis chapter 49, uh, verse 10. I want to read that one for us. Genesis 49, verse 10. And this is also seen, actually, in, in the Hebrew Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. It says that there, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Now, Shiloh, every scholar that, that every scholar that I know of uh, looks to that phrase and uh, comes to the conclusion that it is Christ as king. Now, what the passage says, though, is that the scepter is not going to depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. What that a scepter is a, a, a an icon of rule, an icon of law. Uh, it is something that indicates, you know, usually the scepter is found in a person's hand sitting in a throne, you know, and that person, he's the king. Okay, but it says that the scepter is going to depart from Judah when Shiloh comes. Is Christ not also our king? Is Christ not also our Lord? Why then would he not have a scepter? Why would, why would it depart all of a sudden? The difference is, is that in the case of the physical kings that were in the tribe of Judah, it was a part of that seed promise, and, and it was thrust upon the people. Of course, they asked for a king. We want a king like all the other nations, they cried out. You know, and so God said, okay. You know, and, and that was a part of his plan. He knew the people would cry out for a king. And so we have Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. You are going to be under the scepter until Shiloh comes. And so that when Shiloh, when Christ came... It's, it's a different form of rule because Jesus wasn't forced on the throne. He is a volunteer. He did this of his own free will. We know that it was difficult. We've talked about his prayer in the garden. He prayed three times that, 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 that this cup would be removed from him. But in each case he said what? Yet not my will but thine be done. And that's what Christ did did. Um, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 14 talks about that uh, uh, lineage there, you know, um, that Christ came through uh, through Judah. Uh, and of course chapter 2 verse 14 is the fulfilling. You know, since the, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless, him, powerless uh, uh, that he might render powerless him who had the power over death, that is the devil. That's what Christ did. That's what he did. So here's the question for you today. You know, we, we have we have this history. The, the church that Christ built, Christ's church, is historical. Are you a part of it? Are, 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 are you hanging out, you know, on the outside? Are you still waiting to get in. If you are not in Christ's church, you can be. All you have to do is follow the same information that Peter gave in Acts chapter 2 when the people heard what he preached about Christ and him being crucified and they were pierced in their heart and said in verse 37, What shall we do? And Peter says, Repent. Let each of you be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you shall receive the forgiveness, the remission of sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 41, with many other words, he said, Be saved from this perverse generation. You're still on the outside. You're still on the outside. If there's any way that we can help you today, come forward with these things. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? 
Are you?